call attention to myself or anything. I mean, I am up here with the microphone, but I don't know how many of you noticed, but I had a birthday this past week. I mean, I'm just, just, I did. I know it happens. I know. I know. I'm, I'm really adjusting to 35. It's a little tough. Just a little. It's a little tough. Thank you for all the greetings. Thank you for all the well wishes. Thank you for all the texts and the messages on Facebook. I sat on the beach with my family and just opened them up like I was opening up a pile of cards. It was precious. Thank you so much. And as I have been getting older, Debbie has been after me to develop a healthier eating lifestyle. Yeah. Debbie has been encouraging me to eat healthier as I slowly get a little older. You know, she's, she works out and she's got a different kind of regimen in terms of food and all. But see, the problem is she's such a great cook. And I just love her cooking. And, and, and we enjoy going out and we, we just enjoy all kinds of, we're foodies. We just enjoy the flavors and the taste. And she, she, you know, with every passing year, she seems to get a little more impassioned with her plea to me to start eating healthier. And I realized something this week as I'm getting older and getting wiser that probably in my life, the, the, the most balanced meal that I enjoy, the most balanced part of my diet is the Philly cheesesteak. I, I just, I really have come to love this thing. I mean, if you think about it, you got bread, you got cheese, you got meat. That's all the food groups. You got them all in this one sandwich. I love it. And Debbie occasionally will say, Paul, you're not eating enough salad. That's no problem. I'm going to get a cheesesteak hoagie. They'll put some lettuce on there, some onions. I got my salad. I'm good to go. And when she bugs me about not eating enough fruit, you know what I do? Boom. I go pizza steak. Because tomato sauce is made with tomatoes, and tomatoes are fruit. I got my fruit. This is the perfect sandwich. I'm telling you, it's life-sustaining. Sometimes, speaking of food, sometimes, as I prepare and I've used this analogy from time to time in our journey. Sometimes I feel like I'm a cook in a kitchen. Sometimes I feel like I'm Chef Paul. I really do. I, I feel like, I feel, now I can't cook. I can do breakfast a little bit. I can't really cook. But sometimes I feel as God is giving me the message. And I say, God, I want it to be a balanced and a healthy message. I mean, not just bacon. It's got to be a little more than that. Balanced diet in life is important. Balanced diet in the spirit is even more vital. Now, I'm going somewhere tonight. Balanced diet. Making sure what you're taking into your spirit, your soul, your, your eternal soul, is not all just the good stuff. Not all just the cheesesteaks, but occasionally you're going to eat the broccoli and the peas and the lima beans. Because you see, here's what scripture says. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 6, he said to you and I, blessed, which in this, in this context means this, joyful and nourished by God's goodness. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be completely satisfied. Now, that's referring to a balanced spiritual intake. If you and I will allow the Holy Spirit to not only encourage us, but also challenge us, to not only inspire us, but to convict us, then God says you will be nourished by his goodness, and if you came hungry tonight in the Spirit, you're not leaving this place empty. You will leave full. Why? How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit has been stirring in my heart once again all week. Saying, you take a little bit of this and put it in that. And you stir it up and give it some time. And now we're going to add a little bit of this. And, and as it all comes together, I'm like, here we go. It's time for the next installment. And although this, now I'll just tell you, this may be a little different tonight. Right? Maybe a little more of a sober message tonight. Maybe it's a little more of the vegetables tonight. Maybe we won't laugh quite as much in this message as we do often. Maybe I won't be quite as comical because, you see, some subject matter requires us to be sober. Some subject matter requires us to just stop for a moment and say, okay, many good times are coming. 
But for these next few minutes, we calm our spirit. We calm our hearts. We say, God, talk to me individually. Convict me individually. And so I want to talk tonight on the subject of the domino effect. Let me lead off by telling you something that you're aware of, but I want to remind you that your decisions today and every day impact your life tomorrow. Things you and I have done today, sometimes they seem insignificant, but in the right context, the right time, the right person, the right place, it can have an impact for your entire life. Now, that can go both ways. I've had people that I've met in seemingly random situations, ended up connecting with them, and it ended up leading to a job. Beautiful. Moving into a new phase of career. I've had that happen in my life. But there are times, as we're going to look tonight, the journey of David, there are times when we can also set in motion some things we wish would have stopped. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be misled or don't be deceived or don't fool yourself. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always, always, always harvest what you plant. Now that sounds foreboding, but this too goes both ways. So many in this room have been sowing really good seed. You've sown seeds of faithfulness. You, you will reap a harvest for that. Beautiful fruit is coming. Some of you have sown in financial ways into this ministry to bless other people. You will reap a harvest for that. Good crops are coming. Some of you have sown into love and caring for others. I'm telling you, God said, don't be fooled. It's going to come back, and a beautiful harvest is coming. But of course, we know in life, there is the other side of the pendulum swing, which is be careful of the words you speak. Be careful of the actions you do. Be careful of the relationships you cultivate. Be careful of the things day to day because we are all in one way or another planting seed. God says eventually that seed will have a harvest. Either good or not so good. So we're going to pick up the account tonight in Scripture. David has been king for probably about 10 years. Remember I told you this series isn't going to be chronological. We're going to do it thematic. So we're, we're jumping a little bit ahead of where we were last week, and we'll be bouncing around. You'll excuse me for that. i just just going based on how I feel the Lord is leading theme-wise. So David has been king for about 10 years. He's in his palace. He's kind of got it made. He's got a family. We pick up the account in the book of 2 Samuel. Chapter 11, and very first verse, here's how this chapter begins. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, King David sent his general Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reba. However, Scripture says, King David stayed behind in Jerusalem. I'm talking tonight the subject of domino effect. A seeming innocuous verse. You might just pass right by this, but when we begin to see the chain of events that began with the fact that he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He's a king, it's a time of war, and where is David? Well, he just stayed behind. The next verse through the narrative says, Late one afternoon after his midday rest. Now, the Scromali translation would say after his nap. I love a good nap. Anybody else love a good nap? Amanda said to me this week, she actually said, Dad, what do you want for your birthday? I said, I want a nap. <laughs> and I got one on the beach with my toes in the sand and the ocean behind me, that sound, it was so relaxing. It was so wonderful. I got a nap. So nothing wrong with naps, but put it together. David's not where he's supposed to be. War is going on, and he's chilling. As a matter of fact, he just took a nap. He gets out of the bed in late afternoon, and because his palace was the highest building in the town, he's walking on the roof, and he's looking out and surveying the community of Jerusalem, his kingdom. And the very next verse tells us, as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty 
taking a bath. Now, right there, I wish the next words were, he turned around, he went back in, and he had dinner with his family. I wish it said something like he, he stopped in his tracks. He just said, I, I can't look there. I'm just going to go cut the grass or something. But he doesn't. He's not where he's supposed to be. He's chilling when he should be fighting. And he's looking a little too long. And the rest of the verse says this. He sent someone to find out who is this woman. And he was told she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Pause there because I want to walk through this. I I want you to get the the, the narrative here as as it is in context. It's significant that it was Uriah the Hittite was mentioned. You see, Bathsheba was married to somebody very close and very special to David. That's who this woman was. Now, Uriah the Hittite, Hittites were a a nation that was there many generations earlier as Israel took over Canaan. And it's one of the nations they did not eradicate. And rather, the Hittites integrated into Israel culture. They worshipped Yahweh. They sang to the same God you sang to tonight. They, They became part of the army. And this man, Uriah, actually was an amazing soldier, pointed out in 2 Samuel chapter 23, the highlight of David's mighty men. He was, in verse 39, called out by name. So get it now. David knows Bathsheba's husband really well. He was a fighter. As a matter of fact, at that moment, Uriah is fighting while King David is home. Uriah was laying his life on the line as soldiers do while King David was taking a nap. And he holds the gaze. And what happens next, I'll just go through and list the next events in the next 20 verses. Here's what happens. He summons Bathsheba. She comes to the palace, and they have intimate relations. And the dominoes continue to fall. Bathsheba eventually becomes pregnant from the relationship. David decides he's going to devise a plan to cover up his sin. He summons Uriah from the, from the fighting field. I'll, I'll just summarize it for you. Brings him back into town and says, dude, you're doing such a great job. I want you to spend a few nights at home with your wife and just relax. You earned the rest. David's thought was if the husband's home with his wife, nobody will ever know who the father is of this child. And Uriah, being the soldier and the loyal servant of the king, he says, listen, my other brothers in arms are still at war. I'm not going home to my house to hang out and be comfortable. I'm going to sleep here on the floor until you let me go back to the front lines. And this went on not once but twice. And Uriah just would not go home because he says, how can I chill while my brothers are fighting? So David eventually sends him back to the front lines as the plan is unsuccessful, but it doesn't stop there. You see, all along in our journey with God, as we may have missteps, as we may have started some things in motion, that are not pleasing to God. All along, I assure you of this, God will be trying to get us to stop. God in his mercy and his grace will be trying to say, that's enough. Ask forgiveness right here and let's deal with it from this point. When the plot failed to have Uriah back with his wife, that was an amazing sign of God's mercy saying to David, stop, enough. But instead... David takes things to the extreme. I'm going to say it again. Our decisions today will impact tomorrow. There's a man named Ravi Zacharias. Many of you know him. He's a wonderful author, a Christian orator, and 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 just a a scholar and an apologist for Christianity. He, He said a quote many years ago that I want to show you tonight. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it costs more than you want to pay. Now I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is not mad at you tonight. 
in love, in grace, and mercy. He has sent me with a message, with a red flag. Someone, stop the dominoes falling. Someone, correct your course. Because the direction you're heading is going to be farther than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. God's mercy is calling tonight. Now here's what we all have. We all have blind spots. We all have them. You think about David in this situation. David's got it made. He's got all the power, got all the money. He's finally where God called him to be. He is in the lap of success. He has absolutely got it going on. And in the middle of this moment in his life, he makes a misstep that goes out of control. How many people have we read over the years? Ministers, politicians, uh, uh, other, uh, other uh, maybe celebrities that in the peak of their success, they do something that seems to be unbelievably stupid. And it ruins their career. It ruins their standing. We've seen it over and over. And you say, how can David, the anointed one, the one who wrote the 23rd Psalm, how can he be in this position? We all have blind spots. Somewhere in David's situation, he got complacent. He took for granted the blessings, the power, the, the wonderful provisions that God had given him, the price that it cost him to get to that place of, of success, he took it for granted and let his guard down. Now that is a condition of, of human nature that is baffling at times. But I know one thing for sure. God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and his Holy Spirit is always calling us. He's always dealing with us. And we've all got blind spots. We've all got places where we, we don't see it coming. I have an analogy of a, I used to travel a lot for business even as the Haven was starting. I had a, a corporate job and I did a lot of traveling throughout the United States. And, you know, you, you just, you get to the airport and you rent a car. And sometimes, you know, I like cars. And so I would try different vehicles and, you know, get the big ones, the small ones, the fast ones, the ridiculous electric ones. I'm sorry. One time, one of my last trips I took last year, I got a car that had all the bells and whistles, including you know, one of those uh, navigation safety systems, automated safety guidance system, you know? It could park itself. When I was driving down the interstate, if I got distracted and I started going in the other lane, some of your cars do this, the steering wheel it vibrated. It's just like reminding, hey, yo, get back, get back. If there was a car in my blind spot, the side view mirror would flash. It had these sensors all around the car. Now, it was a little creepy at times because at times I'm going, just let me drive. But, but I believe that's a beautiful analogy of the Holy Spirit. See, the system was trying to keep me in the lane that was safe. The system in that car had warnings that were trying to keep me from harm's way. That is the job of the precious Holy Spirit who we sang to tonight in this house. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Not just to give me goosebumps. I appreciate that. Not just to bring some emotion and a tear to my eye. I appreciate that. But you are welcome here to keep us in the lane of safety. To send the, the warning. To flash the light. It hasn't crashed. It's not an accident. It's not a dangerous situation yet. It's just a warning. Because we all have our blind spots. So the challenge is to remain sensitive to him. Ephesians 5.17 says this. We must be careful how we live. And God's word says don't live like fools. But like those who are wise making the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Now we can absolutely apply that to a life that we want to stay safe and in the middle of God's will. This is basically saying, don't be careless. Feel the warning. Feel it. Don't be reckless. Your walk with God 
It is not necessarily fragile, but humanity and the way we live sometimes can be. Be careful. Don't be fools. Be wise. Listen and heed. Because things set in motion. You know, I noticed, I watched a few videos. I was going to play a clip tonight, but just, just didn't have time to get it loaded where somebody had one of these really big domino things where they set it up and had all the designs. And one of the things I noticed is the first ones move a lot slower than the ones move toward the end. In other words, the more fall, the more the speed picked up. Now, the warning, the caution to you and I is if things are starting to go in a direction displeasing to God, catch it early because the speed and the momentum picks up and oftentimes it's out of your control. And so it was with David. For we read what happens next in 2 Samuel 11, 14 through 17, that he sent orders to the general Joab and he said, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is the fiercest. Then pull back so he will be killed. I know, right? You just go, what? Manipulative. Led the man to his death. Sure enough, Joab assigned Uriah to the spot close to the city walls where they knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And you know what they were fighting with? They were, they were archers. He put him close enough, well within the range of the archers. And sure enough, the enemy came out of the city. Uriah the Hittite was killed. And not only him, but several other Israelite soldiers. These soldiers served their king. And their king was David, who just put them in harm's way. And the dominoes continue to fall. And the man who wasn't where he was supposed to be, what he was called to do. The man who was napping when he should have been fighting. The man who looked a little too long. The man who pursued that look and things continued. Now he has committed murder. It's unbelievable when you think about it. The sweet psalmist of Israel, David, is called. Now he has got murder in his heart and he has fulfilled it. But what happens next? What happens next is such an amazing display of the love of our God. Because you see, God did what he always does. He was trying to convict David. He was trying to probe David as things are going out of control. But eventually what he did was he sent someone with a message to him. He sent a prophet named Nathan. God will always put somebody in your life in his love and grace and mercy to get your attention. He loves you that much. And it may embarrass you and it may even humiliate you, but ultimately it can save your eternal soul. That's how much God loves you. He stirred a man named Nathan. He sent him to David and Nathan had a lot of guts. I respect this dude. He went to the most powerful man in the world at least in his country, and he began to tell him a story, a parable, and it basically ended up convicting David. And, and eventually Nathan says, listen, that guy in that story, it's really you. You're the man. You murdered Uriah the Hittite, and you stole his wife. Whoa. What happens next is the key to redemption and restoration. It was in this account and it is tonight. David looks at him. He's done running. He's done denying. And David says these words, I have sinned against the Lord. And what that does is it now opens up for the love and the mercy and the grace of God to begin the process of healing and restoration. I have shared my personal journey and testimonies at times here. And I shared the one where I was a professional musician and I was absolutely in a lifestyle that was so far from God. And I'll just reiterate one little part of it because I believe it bears repeating. I was playing in a club and the you know, frenzy of the party atmosphere was frenzy and it was a Sunday evening and my wife was in church and I'm at this club and I'm about to just set the place on fire with our music and a storm rolls in. 
Because it was out on the water, the owner of the club says, you gotta, we're going to uh, close the tarps down and wrap up your equipment. We're just going to party. We're not going to, you, know, you guys, we're still going to pay you, but everybody's out here, but the rain is coming. Let's just ride out the storm, and oh, this is going to be fun. Yes, this is going to be fun. I was standing around in that crowd. Cocktail in my hand. The party is revved up. I'm right in the middle of it. Ring leading the madness. And I heard a cry from within my eternal soul. I heard one word, and that word was, run. Run for your life. And it was so profound, and it was so, so, just, just so loud in my ears, even though it wasn't necessarily audible. And the storm was raging, lightning coming, just torrential rain, and a 300-yard boardwalk back to the mainland from where this club was. I put my cocktail down. I said to everybody there before I had time to talk myself out of it, I said, I got to go, and I took off into the storm. And as the tears began to stream down my face and I began to get drenched and just running, I knew I had to get to that church. I had to get someplace where the presence of God was and maybe I'd have another opportunity. And maybe he'd redeemed all those things that I squandered, the time and the talent, relationships, those things he gave me as a blessing that I had let slip through my hands from my own arrogance. I got to that church. I have no idea what the man spoke about. But at the end, I found a place to pray. And I said, God, if you will. I said, I've sinned against you. If you will, take me back. I don't know how we get there, but I'll live for you. I'll do my best. I'll serve you. And God has brought me from that path to my feet on this carpet tonight. Why? Because his mercy that he had toward David, getting his attention, getting in his face, he still does it. Did it to me. Can do it to those in your life that you think are hopeless. They're not hopeless. God can get their attention. Let me help you as a pastor a little bit tonight. Let me say this emphatically. Temptation is not sin. David on that roof, seeing the woman, that's not sin. The lingering, the pursuing, the following through. Think of it this way. Temptation is like a train. You're standing at the station. The train comes through. We all have our weak spots. We all have our things that, that are our, our, our bullseye, that, that the devil just targets us at. Sometimes it's lust. Sometimes it's substance, whatever, relationship. It's all kinds of things. The train rolls in the station. You're standing there. It wants to get your attention. If you don't get on board, it's leaving the station. Here's how James says it. I'm standing on the truth of God's word tonight. James 4, 7, humble yourselves before God. In other words, stay tender before him. Submit yourself to him. And guess what? If we resist the devil, he will flee from you. I get tempted all the time. I'm flesh and blood. There's stuff all over. I've got a past. I've got things that come to the surface. It's always there. The key is if you resist, the strength of the Lord will then empower you and that train will move on. Now you'll fight again, but you'll live to fight again. Here's what else scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, not if. This is God saying, I know it's coming. When you're tempted, he, God, will show you a way out so that you can endure. But you and I have to be willing to take that way out. You and I have to be willing to do our part and resist. And even that moment of resisting, God's power and strength can allow us a way of escape. It's an awful feeling to have the guilt of falling time and time again. It's an awful feeling. And the enemy of your soul will use that to beat you over the head all night long. He'll torment you in your sleep. Once in a while, it is awesome to be able to say, I, I withstood one time. I won a battle. The war's still going, but I won this time. I didn't get on the train. I fought it. I resisted it. And God gave me a way out. Take that and smack him in the head with it once in a while. All right, let me keep teaching. Respond to conviction quickly. 
Remember, David said right away, I've sinned against the Lord. He didn't say, I'm caught. He said, I've sinned. And let me just bring you at ease here. The difference between conviction and condemnation. you got to get this. It will help you in your spiritual journey. Condemnation comes from Satan. Condemnation makes us feel so guilty, it wants us to run from God's presence. If you've ever had a bad week and you've stumbled and you've fallen a lot, and the last place you want to be is here... That's condemnation. That is not God. That's the devil keeping you away. Because what conviction does is it draws you to the heart of God. And that the heart of God is love. And love forgives and love sets free. Conviction. We feel guilt, but we feel drawn to God's heart. Jesus said, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. He does that through the precious Holy Spirit. I draw you not to kill you. I draw you to give you life. I draw you to give you freedom and victory. Let me continue. I'm so glad that God's mercy and grace is greater than our sin. Somebody want to give him thanks for that tonight. His mercy and grace. Greater than our sin. We love this verse around here. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and justified to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, but I keep falling for the same sin. He can forgive it over and over again. There's no limit there. It doesn't say you got 10 times. When you use those up, too bad. No, the mercy and grace of God is greater. And I love this verse in Hebrews 4, 16. Let us with confidence, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. I don't know how you picture God. I don't know if you've ever pictured him sitting up there as a mean old man with a beard. Not that there's anything wrong with a beard, I hope, really. I don't know if you picture him that way. But here's how you should picture him. Sitting on a throne, the very throne is grace unmerited favor and blessing. That's the throne God sits on. And he says, come in confidence into my presence as you feel the drawing. Someone in the house is feeling that drawing right now. I know it. I hear it. I sense it. God is saying by his Holy Spirit, don't fear, but come with confidence because it's a throne of grace. And there you'll find mercy. Mercy says, you're guilty, but I still forgive you. And you'll find grace to help in your time of need. So let me land this plane. Let me wrap up and ask, how are you going to react to conviction? We all fall. We all stumble. All have sinned and come short of God's glory, Scripture says. And the Holy Spirit faithfully will convict. He will. That's his job. You're going to feel the flashing light. How are you going to respond? I love what David wrote at this point of being nailed. He is guilty. He is absolutely going to face some repercussions. Listen, God forgave him, but there were still things from his actions that he had to pay for for the rest of his life. But as far as his relationship with God, it was mended and it was made whole. And in those moments of being exposed, in those moments of being found guilty, he writes the beautiful penitent psalm, Psalm 51. Now, if you don't have Psalm 51 marked in your app or your physical Bible or whatever you use, you need to. Because I promise you, this will be a prayer you will pray your whole life. I promise you there are going to be times where all you can say is, have mercy. Have mercy on me, oh God. Not because I deserve it, but because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. This is when David was exposed. He didn't run. He laid his heart bare. Why? Because God says, I'm sitting on a throne of grace. You can come. And he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Oh, this world can get on us, can it? Sometimes it just feels like the dust and dirt of this life are all on us. And sometimes it feels like it's even gotten our heart. But I pray like David prays, create in me a clean heart. 
Renew a loyal or a right spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and make me willing to obey you. Can I tell you what the rest of the story as we go through this journey, God answers that prayer. David has a fruitful life. David has a, a beautiful family. David ends up leading in victory. God answers that prayer and he still does. He still does. I don't know how your heart feels tonight, but if it doesn't feel very clean, God says, ask me. I'll make it clean. Restore the joy of my salvation. You ask. God says, I will do it. So let me wrap with this. Remember, David was chosen because of his heart. Remember, that was the difference. He had a heart after God. That's why Samuel found him. That's why Samuel anointed him. That's the difference here. When he fell, he still knew where to come. And in that Psalm 51, verse 17, David says, You will not reject a broken and a repentant heart, O God. Can you guys bow your heads for a moment tonight? I'm going to let you go in a minute. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. I wonder if tonight in this room, maybe you're willing to admit that you're in a situation where you need to be restored to God. Perhaps some of your own actions has created some distance and you you felt a gentle tug at your, your heart all night. You have felt a little bit of a nudge all night sitting here realizing that, yes, you've toppled some dominoes, but yes, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love and grace and mercy and conviction is in the house, not pushing you away, but drawing you to God. I just want to pray with you tonight. Say a prayer for restoration. I want to say a prayer for forgiveness. If you're in the house and that's you tonight, would you raise your hand? You feel like you need to do some damage control, your relationship with God all over the room. I see it. I see it. I see it. Listen, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. This is God drawing you to his heart. I see it all over this room tonight. I see it. Yes, God is moving. God is stirring. Why is he doing it? To restore that relationship with you and him. He loves you with an unconditional love. He loves you more than you can imagine or comprehend. And right now, He is pulling you to that heart of love. I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to repeat it. So out of respect for those that raise their hands, can we all say this prayer together? Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your love and thank you for conviction. Right now I'm asking, forgive me my sin. Forgive me my disobedience and create in me a clean heart. Now, Father, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. Help me live for Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody rejoice in the house tonight.
someone's life right now in the name of Jesus in this house in this house in this house thank you for your grace can you thank him for his love tonight can you just lift a hand and thank him can you thank him for his love tonight can you thank him for his love tonight thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Lord sing that bridge again Jesus' name. 
Amen, amen. I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys. I love you guys.